So good morning, everyone. Good morning. And I apologize for not um, reading some scriptures last week about Thanksgiving. I totally forgot. That's what goes on in this house. And um, But I do want to start. I want to open with a Thanksgiving scripture. It's Psalm 107, number 1, verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. You know, he is so good that we can't even um, put it into words, the goodness of the Lord. So I just want to thank him. It was a different kind of Thanksgiving for us and maybe for a lot of you too. But that's part of life, isn't it? And for 2020, we'll always remember the isolation of Thanksgiving. But for me, at least, I found that um, it, it helped me reflect on what I have and and how good God has been so good. I mean, really, I don't, I don't know what to say. He has blessed us abundantly, and um, and I'm sure you all feel that way too. It's not about riches of the world. It's about the riches in God. So today, um, I'm going to open up with um, Psalm 31 for communion. So make sure you have your elements there. I'm sorry, Psalm 34, I don't even know what I said. Psalm 34, and um, I want to give you some background to this psalm, and then it'll make more sense to you. David wrote this psalm. Um, David probably was a confused young man. He slayed Goliath for King Saul and um, saved, saved the kingdom for Saul. And yet Saul was very jealous of David. And Saul ultimately wanted to destroy and kill David. And how weird is that? I mean, he was loyal to Saul. He was, um, he did everything Saul asked and he did it with fidelity. He was righteous, but Saul just hated him. And it made me think about so many times we run into people that just hate us. They just hate us. And we'll walk away and go, why Why do they hate me so much? And maybe it's not because of us. Maybe it's hopefully something in us, the Jesus in us, that they just, they just despise the light. And I know I'm not perfect, so Lord knows they, they could be really seeing some things in my heart that they can't stand. And I'm, I repent from those things. But here's David, and so eventually he realizes that Saul's going to kill him. So he goes running. So he leaves one camp, one king, and runs to another king, the king of his enemy, the king of the um, Philistines, the very king of, of the group. He killed Goliath. So he runs there, but... In his own strength, he figures out a way to get to the king of the Philistines. So he acts like he's crazy. And he goes scratching on the gates. And he, he drools down his beard. And he acts like a total madman, thinking this will get him in. This will, this will get him to the king of the Philistines and he'll be safe. The king is like, what is wrong with this guy? What is wrong with this guy? I don't want any part of him. So in, in um, Samuel, 1 Samuel um, 22, so David just takes off. Here he is. He goes to one camp. We can call him the Republicans. He goes to another camp. We can call him the Democrats. And he can't find peace. He can't find what he's looking for. So he takes off. And in chapter 22, the first verse, it says, David therefore departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. Adullam means hiding, retreat. So he goes there. So when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress. Listen to this. Everyone that was distressed, who was in debt, poor, 
And everyone who was disconnected gathered to him. He didn't have the nobles. He didn't have the elite. He had the down and out coming to him and going in that cave with him and hiding with him and retreating with him. So he became captain over them and there were about 400 men with him. 400 men in this cave and David became their leader. It reminds me in, um, if you turn with me to Matthew 9, 9 verse 9, you know Jesus when he walked the earth, you never saw him going to leaders and appealing to them for their aid, for their support. He never went to them for um, uh, agendas. He didn't say, okay, I'll support you in this if you support me in that. He didn't do any of that. He didn't even bother with them. But, and it's interesting too, the people he went to and who he gathered under his wings. In 9.9, it says, And as he passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax office. And he said to him, Follow me. And, and so he arose and followed him. And now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. We all are sinners, and we all came to that place. We came to that, that crossroad that led to the cave of Adullam, that led us in to follow a leader who was righteous and follow a leader who did not have allegiance to the right or to the left, but had allegiance to God only. See, in this hour, so many of us, um, we, we were raised in a world where we felt safe. I know I did. I grew up in the 50s and it was, uh, it was about safe. It was about you know, my dad had a job, my mom was a good mom, and, and everything was safe for us. And now we're living in a world where, um, for a lot of us, that is foreign to us. But yet, a lot of cultures have lived in an era of unsafety, lived in an era of um, imbalance and um, unsurety. And here we are now, living in this world with economic uncertainty, physical uncertainty. Um, and the very people that Jesus came for, the distraught, the, the disabled, the disheartened, that's who he came for, to set them free. I found it, this quote, and I, shame on me, I didn't write down where I found it. I, I just thought it was really, really interesting. Um, it says, Jesus' friends were war hawks. Remember all the times they talked about, let's bring down fire on this town or whatever. They were war hawks. They wanted vengeance. But Jesus was harmless as a dove. The apostles were anxious for violence. They were annoyed by children. Lord, should we, should we send these children away? They squabbling for power. Remember, who is the greatest in the kingdom? Is it me? Can it be me? Will I sit by your right hand? They were just little country bumpkins, easily wowed by the big city lights. They just wanted, they wanted the world. These are the people to whom Jesus revealed his secrets, even though he was often sighing 
over their faithlessness. I can just picture them taking those deep sighs sometimes. So in this hour, when we read Psalm 34, it's very interesting to me that whatever David did, um, he was righteous as far as concerning Saul. And he, and it just, it just angered Saul. And once Saul died, David was, um, you know, he was God's king. He was God's appointed. He took his throne. But um, let's read Psalm 34 together and maybe really meditate on what David says about this time he's in the cave, this time he's been figuring some things out about God and that it's not, it's not seeking men. It's seeking the Father. And so let's read. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Be in my mouth. That's incredible. And I think it's interesting. It's not just in your mind. It's not just in your heart, but it's in your mouth. This is a, a psalm many times people pray before communion, and I keep that in mind too. My soul shall make it boast in the Lord. Humble shall hear of it and be glad. The humble. O oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Notice he wants unity. He wants us to come together. Even if it's in a cave, not a palace. He wants us unified. I sought the Lord and he heard me. And he delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant. So the men in the cave looked and they just, their faces were radiant. These, these nobodies became somebodies in Jesus. And their faces were not ashamed. And David saying, this poor man, David, cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. This is again for communion. It's not just about our feelings. It's that we, we can physically, we can physically engage with Jesus. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. I just want to mention that David receives because he believes. David receives protection and deliverance because he trusts and he looks to God. Once you children listen to me, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. See, he had the fear of the Lord, and that's why God answered. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Well, that's pretty heavy in this hour because I know I've heard a lot of Christians saying some nice, nice things and 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 I feel like not anybody watching of course but I feel like a lot of people are um, spreading seeds of um, deceit around uh, to the body uh, depart from evil and do good seek peace and pursue it I think that's what Jesus was really all about seeking peace and pursuing it he never he never sought war. He never sought division. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. That's pretty heavy. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears, and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. 
So when you come to the Lord and you're broken, He embraces you. When you're broken, you have nothing left. When you're broken, you need God. And until we are broken of our wills, we serve ourselves. We serve men in our land. God wants us broken to serve him. But many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. I think it's it's hard in this hour sometimes to believe that psalm. It's saying that no matter what, God is with me. No matter what, as long as I fear God. I have to fear God. See, there's there's always there's always like a two parter to Jesus, his promises. He'll do this if you do this. And I really feel that um if we fear him, we will act differently. You know, it's funny because last night I was thinking, boy, I don't even know who watches this. I don't even know who's out there. I don't even know who's watching me. And that gives me an uneasy feeling. And then I stopped and I thought, wait a minute. Why should I care who's watching me on cyberspace? God watches me every day. His heavenly house, watch, they watch me every day. Am I nervous about that? Do I fear that? <laughs> That's where I need to be a little bit more um, on the ball, really. I, I need to fear God in, in all his righteousness. And he is a merciful God. And we have so much to be thankful for. So I just want to end with, um, sometimes it's good to go into the cave of hiding. Sometimes it's where God is leading us to get on our knees and re-examine our hearts. Sometimes in that cave where it's so dark, it seems so dark and we seem so alone, as we praise him and pray to him, he lifts us. And what's so interesting to me is that he will send, he will send an army. He will send fellow men, even though they're not the ones we may think we need or the ones we would choose. But God knows all things and he knows what we need and he knows what they need. And it, it, it's all in his timing and it's all in his will. So I just want to say, Lord, thank you so much for coming to this earth and showing us the way, really showing everything you did, everything you did. You were not hung up into power. You were not hung up into, um, into politics. You weren't hung up into agendas. You were hung up into your father and bringing light and life to this dark world. And Lord, I just pray that as you were on the cross dying for us, Lord, and, and the Father had to look away, and it killed him, and it killed you to be a part, you sacrificed that for us. But we, we pray that you give us the strength to make those hard decisions. You give us the strength to walk the path you walk, dear Lord. And I, I just pray, dear Jesus, that this would be a new day for all of us, Lord, a new day where we look to the heavens, not to the right or to the left, but we look up. And thank you again, Lord, for your sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. So it's, it's at this time we take um, the bread. And um, thank you for the sacrifice, Jesus.
Thank you for the blood. Life in the blood, Lord. Thank you for your blood. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. And I thank God for every one of you. And I thank God for God. Amen. We're going to continue with the prophetic significance of the Psalms of David. We are reading uh, our, our order of the Psalms, reading one a day. We're in Psalm 34. That's book one, the Genesis book. The Genesis book deals with beginnings, and we're seeking the Lord right now for new beginnings in the church. When the Lord does something new, when he renews his covenant with his people, when he does something that he's never done before, the response of God's people is a new song. And actually, Psalm 33 which was our psalm for yesterday, verse 3 says, Sing to him a new song. And so we are looking for new beginnings in the church. Also, the, the five books in the psalms follow Israel's history of the kingship. So book one is also the, the book of David. Uh, David is the start of the kingdom of God's manifestation in Israel. And that's why the majority of the Psalms in book one are Psalms of David. In fact, up to this point where we're at, which is Psalm 34, there are only four Psalms uh, up to 34 that are not attributed to David. Psalm one and two, which begin the entire book of the Psalms, uh, have no one uh, in the superscription in terms of uh, an author or a writer. And Psalm 33, which we just quoted, does not have anyone in the title of the Psalms. Uh, Psalm 10 does not have a title, but Psalm 9 is said to be written by David, and in many of the ancient manuscripts, Psalm 9 and Psalm 10 are a single psalm. So it may be even up to this point, 34 psalms that only one uh, only three of those psalms are not attributed to David. Last week we looked at Psalms 16 through 26 as an example of the prophetic significance of David's psalms and we're going to pick up with Psalm 27 today and go as far as we can. Now keep in mind the whole purpose of the Psalms is, is eschatological. And by that, we mean how God accomplishes his purposes in the earth. So when we're looking at how God works in the life of David, how he originates Israel, whether it's uh, originating Israel in the deliverance at the Red Sea from Egypt, or it's originating the kingdom in Israel under David. When we, we look at the Psalms, the Psalms are teaching us how God begins to establish his kingdom and his kingship. Now, one of the key words, and we're looking for common themes at this point as we read each Psalm, and keep in mind too that the Psalms, the order that they're put in, were not just arbitrary. It wasn't just throwing a bunch of sticks in the air. I've used that example before. And they kind of fall down and, oh, we'll put this psalm first and this psalm second and this psalm third. There's an order in the psalms. There's a conceptual framework. There's a, there's a divine order. There's a teaching order. There's a prophetic order in the way the psalms are distributed. Now, one of the key concepts that is emerging as we look through the Psalms is this, this idea of God's steadfast love. We talk about the steadfast love of the Lord. The steadfast love of the Lord is the Hebrew word chesed. We, we've, we've looked at that uh, on a number of occasions. 
and we actually start to see a great occurrence of the word chesed in these uh, in the Psalms in the first book of the Psalms. Uh, chesed is a is a key concept in terms of the character of God. Um, actually, uh, that uh, word itself, the the word uh, chesed, is found in the Psalm uh, in in all of Scripture. It's found two hundred and fifty five times. It's a a very important word in scripture, but 130 of the 255 times that chesed is used is in the Psalms. So I wanted to look initially, as we're going through these Psalms at this particular point, I wanted to look at the references to his steadfast love. Now let me give you um, a a definition of, of this word. Chesed is translated in, in the various English translations as steadfast love or loving kindness or covenant loyalty. It's God's covenant loyalty to his people, his steadfast love that sustains them. It's a relational term that describes an attitude based in fellowship, expressing solidarity between two parties and actions of graciousness that are produced by this relationship. It further describes duties and commitments that one party bears to another as a result of this relationship. Jan mentioned that in her introduction. She talked about God is faithful to us and that creates faithfulness in us and we in turn are faithful to him. To know the Lord is to know and experience all the benefits that proceed from this chesed relationship, this steadfast love. Psalm 33, I said we were going to start in Psalm 27, but just look briefly at Psalm 33. Psalm 33 emphasizes the relationship the Lord has with man through being creator, Verses four through seven, for the word of the Lord is upright. All his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And by the breath of his mouth, all the heavenly host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deep in storehouses. So first of all, the Lord's steadfast love, and it's it's mentioned right there in relationship to righteousness, justice, and faithfulness. Now, faithfulness is a term that we see oftentimes paired with God's steadfast love, and this is speaking of God's character. His steadfast love is that he will always be gracious to maintain his relationship with his people. In fact, the very creation of that relationship is God's grace and God's grace alone. God bends down, if you will. One of the phrases in the Psalms, the Lord bends down from on high to show his mercy unto his people. God begins this relationship in his steadfast love and he maintains it because he is faithful. So we're starting to see righteousness, justice, faithfulness, steadfast love. They all, these concepts cluster together when we're dealing with the person of God and the basis of his relationship with us. Now, this also says, and this is a reference to Genesis, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. The word of the Lord, it says, in the beginning, the earth was what? Without form. It was in chaos. Darkness was there over the face of the great deep, the great abyss, and God said, let there be light. See, he spoke creation into existence by his word. And so when verse six says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, this is the Lord speaking creation. But Jesus is also called in the New Testament, the word of the Lord. So it's not just this impersonal force of God's voice that created the world, but it was a person. Jesus, his word, the embodiment of what is in his heart that he speaks forth. Psalm 33 emphasizes the relationship 
the, of the steadfast love of the Lord has with man through creation, through his divine purposes. Verse eight says, let all the earth fear the Lord, let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be, he commanded and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the people. God works in human history not just to cause the purposes of a nation or the people of that nation to flourish, but rather that his counsel and his purposes, his plan flourishes. He brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the people, but the counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. He, he maintains his steadfast love through creation, through bringing order out of chaos. He brings his steadfast love through his divine purposes by establishing his counsel, his plans, his kingdom. And when the counsels and plans and kingdoms of the earth stand against his plans and purposes, then what he does is he foils them. And then verse 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his inheritance. Now, let's remind us, the nation whose God is the Lord is no particular human nation on earth. Not Russia, not China, not the United States. The nation whose God is the Lord, 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10 state, is the church. The church is a holy nation. See, God deals with the nations of the earth through creation, through establishing order in the earth. And he does this for all nations. When we look at our nation and we look at all the other nations of the earth, they're all God's people. They're all God's nations, and he cares for those nations. And he judges those nations, too, of course, when, when they don't walk in righteousness. But to exalt America, to give it a status greater than all the other nations, brings forth a false national pride that justifies everything America does at the expense of the rest of the world. God's nation, blessed are the people, or the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his inheritance, we, the church, we're the nation, we're his inheritance. And he shows this steadfast love by establishing his plan and his purposes in the church, by reducing chaos in the nations, and as we continue in these verses, through the choosing of his people. Verse 13, we continue, the Lord looks down from heaven, he sees all the children of men. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the heart of them all and observes their deeds. It continues then, he also establishes his steadfast love by the manifestation of his mighty strength. Verse 16, the king is not saved by his great army, the warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war, host, the war horse is a false hope for salvation, for deliverance. It's not talking about salvation in terms of, of, of Jesus' blood makes us righteous before the Lord. Of course, we understand that, that the nations can't bring about salvation. But salvation in the Old Testament in these contexts speaks of Deliverance, deliverance from oppression, deliverance from enemies, deliverance from evil. We cannot look to any nation. What this is saying is similar to what we saw earlier. Some trust in horses, some trust in chariots. We will trust in the name of the Lord our God. No political, economic, military program or agenda can bring deliverance to God's people. It's the Lord's steadfast love 
that brings deliverance. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love. There's chesed again, his steadfast love. That he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine, in all kinds of difficult circumstances. And finally, the Lord's faithfulness is an aspect of his steadfast love. Verse 20, our soul waits for the Lord, for he is our help and our shield, for our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. So we're seeing this concept of chesed, which, which speaks of God's unfailing covenant loyalty to his people to bring them forth in victory for his name's sake. For, for his steadfast love, for his people's sake, for the sake of his kingdom. God does these things in and through and for his people to establish his purposes. Now, this is how God starts new beginnings in the church. If we drop back, and I wanted to pick up with the 27th Psalm, but we, we want to see how this word chesed particularly in the Psalms we've been read, reading and looking at in the last couple of weeks, is ever present. If we go back to Psalm 23, the, the Lord is my shepherd. Psalm 23 closes this way in verse 6. Surely goodness and chesed, steadfast love, shall follow me all the days of my life, shall pursue me all the days of my life. We're looking at this central concept of God's Steadfast love, and we're going to see how, how faithfulness and, and, and other images and other characteristics and other attributes of God enter into the picture. In Psalm 25, which is about the Lord teaching us his ways and teaching us his paths, three times has said is mentioned in Psalm 25, verse 6. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions, but according to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right. He teaches the humble in his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. And faithfulness in the Hebrew means his truth. So all the ways of the Lord, all the paths of the Lord are this covenant loyalty that he expresses to us and his truthfulness. His truthfulness is that he is faithful to fulfill his promises. And when he gives promises to his church, he fulfills them. So this, is, this is how we need to see eschatology, how God establishes his purposes in human history. Even in the midst of all the difficulties and chaos we're facing, his steadfast love and his faithfulness remain firm. If we go to the 26th Psalm, David says in the first verse, Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Now David says to vindicate me, to judge me. But he, 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 while he says that he's walked in integrity, he's, he's allowed his life to be immersed in this constant devotion to the Lord, he still says in the second verse, prove me, O Lord, try me, test my conscience and my heart. Why? Because your steadfast love, your chesed is before my eyes and I will walk in your faithfulness. His steadfast love and his faithfulness, the Lord's, brings us to becoming faithful to the Lord. That, of course, um, leads to another word which we've seen. Chesed leads to the Hebrew word hasid. A hasid is one, is a chesed one, one who walks in the steadfast love of the Lord and one who continues to walk in God's faithfulness, God's truth, God's love, God's grace, God's steadfast love. Those things transform us and we become hasids. We become hesed ones. We become faithful ones of the Lord, devoted to him and to his purposes. And now we'll look at, at Psalm 27. Now it's interesting, there's also a theme of repentance that's going to emerge in uh, 
chapters 27 through uh, at least up to 34 where we are today. There's this idea of repentance that that begins to establish itself and repeat itself. Now, what's interesting about Psalm 27, and we just just celebrated uh, the Feast of the Tabernacles, Jewish New Year, Yom Kippur, Sukkoth, the Feast of the Tabernacles, the Feast of the Ingathering. And Psalm 27 was, was written in relationship to the Feast of the Tabernacles. And it's actually seen in Jewish tradition as being a psalm of repentance. Just as we understand Psalm 51 is a psalm, it's, it specifically says it's the psalm of David's repentance after he sinned with Bathsheba. And we, we're going to see the Psalm 32 as a psalm where David repents of some great serious sin he committed. It may be, again, a reference to the sin of uh, murdering Uriah and sleeping with Bathsheba. Uh, It may be another sin, but Psalm 27 is also taught by the Jewish faith as related to David's repentance in light of his sin with Bathsheba. Let's read it, Psalm 27, 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil doers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and my foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet in this I will be confident. And we see in David's Psalms, there's a lot of talk about warfare. There is a lot of talk about the enemies of God. There's a lot of talk in all of Israel's history. They were a, a constant they they were they were the image of constant oppression in the earth they were constantly being persecuted by the nations david's whole kingship as jan described earlier today it arose in this this whole context of saul being after him and saul was constantly pursuing david to destroy him even though as jan said david was loyal to saul in fact saul was david's father-in-law he married michal saul's daughter But this issue that David was going to be the next king and Saul was going to lose his kingship. See, transition of power uh, doesn't go well when your family is the one that's losing the power. And, And Saul's sons were not going to inherit the kingship. David from another tribe was going to. I mean, David was his son in law, so that there, there's this, this kind of closeness in terms of who would become the king. But Saul is constantly pursuing David. David goes and he'll rescue a city here and he'll rescue a city there. And then the city who is loyal to Saul, who's the legitimate legal king, even though David, it's been prophesied that he's going to be king, then the very cities that David saves, betrays, uh, those cities betray him. He ends up going to the Philistines, the enemies of God's people, and he's constantly being pursued. So when David talks about the steadfast love of the Lord and the faithfulness of the Lord, it's birthed in this concept of constant warfare, constant threat, threats from within, threats from without. You have the enemies of the Lord who are different peoples from Israel. You have the enemies of the Lord who live in Israel, who are brothers and sisters to to David. David is constantly faced with these threats. So so we have to understand that's why there's so much language. That's why there's so much language of of warfare and crying out to God for deliverance from enemies in the Psalms and in David's Psalms in particular. Again, if if you're the anointed of the Lord, and and we're the anointed of the Lord, we're, we're his people, we're called to be on a mission to preach the gospel. If we're the anointed of the Lord, we have a bullseye on us. We have a, we have a target. Where, where David's enemies were actually literal, physical, human enemies, our enemies are powers and principalities. Our enemies are demonic forces that hinder the gospel. In fact, there's kind of a, a switch when we move from Old T- Testament to New Testament that we are to minister to the humans who, who may be the manifestation of the, 
of, of hostility towards us. We're, we're to show them mercy because every enemy is a candidate to be one to the gospel. And our, 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 our primary foes are powers and principalities. They're, they're, they're spiritual wickedness in heavenly, heavenly places. They're demonic forces. But David says this, one thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Now understand, even the priests didn't dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of their lives. They were in and out. David, David is asking for something beyond the physical tabernacle, the physical temple. He's asking for the presence of the Lord, that he may dwell in the heavenly, supernatural house of the Lord, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. Now, this is, this is how David establishes his beginnings, the beginnings of his kingship. He gazes upon the beauty of the Lord, the beauty of the Lord, the awesome, wonderful, majestic, glorious beauty of the Lord that nonetheless, though that awesomeness is fearful, it also brings us to a place of where we really understand what real beauty and real, real goodness is all about. To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord is to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus. To dwell in the house of the Lord forever is to be in Christ. It's to know him, to trust him, to believe in him, and to see the glory of God shining through the face of Jesus. What David is praying for on our side of the cross on our side of salvation history, is to see the face of Jesus. We behold the beauty of the Lord. The Lord then becomes our definition for goodness, for truth, for righteousness, for justice. The Lord is. Not, not, not human concepts, not human illustrations, but the Lord and his written word. And we are going to inquire in his temple. And to inquire in his temple... The implication in the Hebrew is to discern his will, to understand his will. We inquire, Lord. We want to see who you are, and then we want to know what we need to do with who you are as, as we become kings and priests of the Most High God. For he will hide me in his hut in the date of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. Now the hut that he's going to hide me in, in verse 5, is his sukkah. That's the booth. That's where this psalm is associated with tabernacles. Because on the Feast of Tabernacles, the Jews would create those thatched huts, those, those booths, uh, those huts of, of, of branches of trees, and they would dwell in them. And they would dwell in them and say, God the God of the universe, even though I only dwell in a thatched hut, and here come the, the tanks and the guns and the smart bombs of the world are coming against me, Gog and Magog, the, the, the enemies of God are coming up against me to destroy me. Egypt is coming up against us to destroy us. Assyria, Babylon, Rome, we're just in this thatched hut, but we're hidden there in the shelter of the Lord because the Lord plus a thatched hut equals greater than all the powers of the world gathered against us. So because the Jews saw the Sukkah in here, that's where the Feast of Tabernacles, it's the Feast of Sukkoth, the Feast of Booths, the Feast of the Thatched Huts. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent, his tabernacle. He will lift me high upon a rock, and now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tents sacrifices with shouts of joy. And I will sing and make melody to the Lord. And the, the sacrifices with the shouts of joy is the teruah, which is the ram's horn being blown on the Day of Atonement. Now keep in mind the way it worked. You have Jewish New Year. And then you have 10 days between Jewish New Year and Yom Kippur. And then the week of Yom Kippur, we start the eight days of Sukkah. So all of these things, uh, Rosh Hashanah, the, the Jewish New Year, Yom Kippur, the day when God cleanses his people of their sin, and Sukkoth, when they dwell in booths, are all linked together. 
They're all one long continuous feast. Now, there was 10 days between Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, and Yom Kippur. Those were called the days of awe. They were called the days of the 10 days of repentance. And what, what Israel would do in preparing for Sukkoth, for tabernacles, is they would take 10 days to repent, to, to inquire in his temple, and to look at the beauty of the Lord, to understand his will and how we might carry it out. And you know how we carry it out. We need to get right with God. We need to repent. So these 10 days of awe, these 10 days of repentance, led up to... Yom Kippur, which then morphed into Sukkot. When Israel repents, then God establishes his tabernacle, his throne, his kingdom in the earth through a repentant people. Guess which psalm was recited for those 10 days of awe, the 10 days of repentance leading up to Yom Kippur, Psalm 27. So here we have Psalm 27, and this is how we tie repentance into this. Hear, O Lord, verse 7, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. And to seek, the Hebrew word to seek here means to seek with the intent, with a, with a zealous, powerful, passionate intent to understand God's face, God's beauty, God's purposes, God's will. See, this is a very important eschatological psalm. It is something very important that teaches us how God establishes his kingdom in the earth, how he establishes his purposes in human history. You have said, verse 8, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my deliverance, my salvation. You see where repentance here is tied into the establishment of God's kingdom in the earth. It's interesting. For my father and mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. In other words, there's a special aspect of sonship, true sonship, that is being established in God's people as they enter into his holy place to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple, to gaze on his beauty and have his beauty determine what is beautiful and good and truthful and righteousness for us. And second, then, to understand then how, when we see who the Lord is, how we work his will out in the earth. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. If this psalm, as the, the rabbis have said, has to do with repentance concerning the sin of Bathsheba, then what David is saying is, my own sin has disqualified me and it has given cause for the enemies of the Lord to speak against me. But Lord, please Lord, heal me, restore me so that I might continue to fulfill your purposes in the earth. Verse 13, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You look on the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living because you see, you gaze on his beauty in the holy place. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Now that moves us to Psalm 28. Psalm 28, to you, O Lord, I call. My rock, be not deaf to me, lest if you be silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cry to you for help, when I lift my hands toward your most holy sanctuary. Now watch the, the picture of hands here. David says, I'm going to lift my hand toward your holy sanctuary. That ties us into the 27th Psalm. He's lifting his hand toward the holy sanctuary so that the Lord might restore him. The Lord might establish him. 
do not drag me off with the wicked, with the workers of evil. Now, this is interesting because we talk about the enemies of God's people. They're within and without. Paul talked about issues within and issues without. He talked about, about conflict that he had from those who weren't believers, those who are without, and those who were believers, those who are within. I'm not trying to create division in the body of Christ because we can easily turn around and just say, you know, well, this person's the enemy of God and this person's the enemy of God and, you know, I can just call down covenant curses on them. That's not the issue here. The issue is, is that we, we, we're going to experience hostility not only from those outside the faith, but those within. Those within, we pray for that God will heal them and restore them. Those without, we pray that they'll get converted. But notice the nature of this particular enemy. Do not drag me off with the wicked, with the workers of evil, who speak peace with their neighbors while evil is in their hearts. Now we have to understand that Christianity is a confessional faith. We confess with our mouths and we believe in our hearts. But confessionalism isn't the, the ultimate foundation, if you will, of the Christian faith. We confess with our mouths, but we believe in our hearts. When we truly believe in our hearts, our lives are shaped and transformed by that confession. There has to be, this is what integrity is. Integrity is, comes from the word integrate. There has to be an integration between what we speak what's in our hearts and how we live our lives. There has to be this integration. And, and Christians can get to a place where they just, they talk a good talk, but they don't live out the kingdom purposes of the Lord. And this is what David is discovering here, that there may be enemies who, while they speak the Christian language, there's something in their hearts that's inconsistent. Now notice, he puts his hand he lifts his hand toward the sanctuary, David, and it says, give them according to their work, according to the evil of their deeds, give them according to the work of their hands. See, our hands need to be stretched toward the sanctuary. When our hands are stretched toward the sanctuary, we recognize the hand of the Lord. In the middle of this, though, those who speak with their mouths but don't believe with their hearts or evil is in their hearts. The work of their hands is counterproductive to the kingdom work. The great challenge in the church, the great challenge in the body of Christ is bringing the church together in unity, in the confession of our faith, in the belief in our heart, and in the works of our hands. Notice then, Verse 5 says, because they do not regard the works of the Lord or the work of his hands, the Lord will tear them down and build them up no more. Now, eschatology here. We've got to make an important eschatological point here. How does God deal with unrighteousness among his people? He tears things down that contribute to the unrighteousness of his people, and he doesn't build them anymore. Take a look at the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. Jesus, that's what he said. He said, listen, the Messiah has come. I've come. I've come to reveal the steadfast love of the Lord, the faithfulness of the Lord, but my people, Israel, are not recognizing that. There's something in their form of worship that is keeping them from truly seeing who I am. This people worship me with their mouths, but their hearts are far from me. I've got to tear down false worship. See, we're, we're talking about false prophecy. We're talking about false teaching. False prophecy and false teaching generate false worship. False teaching, false prophecy, false worship generates a vision of a false Jesus. And see, the Lord comes in. He doesn't destroy his people. Israel still exists. So, someone once asked uh, um, a famous philosopher, can, can you give me the proof that there's a God? And the philosopher said, yes, the nation of Israel. That's the proof that there's a God. God Israel's still there. 
Israel, the people of Israel still exist because of his steadfast love and his faithfulness toward his people, Israel. But he had to tear down false worship. He has to tear down structures of false worship. If there's going to be a new beginning in the church, structures of false worship must be torn down and not built up again so that God's people then, the, their, 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 the falsity in their lives, the falsehood in their lives can be removed so they can see the beauty of the Lord, so that they can inquire in his temple. And that's why he continues uh, in the 28th Psalm. And at the end of the 28th Psalm, he says this, the Lord is the strength of his people. The Lord is there to strengthen his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. Now, I want you to see this. The Lord is the strength of his people. And how does God work out being the strength of his people? He saves his anointed one. There is an importance to leadership. There is an importance to fivefold ministry. There is an, an importance of authoritative service in the house of God. We call those leaders. And the Lord manifests his strength to his people by strengthening authentic leaders. Those who are, as in Psalm 27, gazing on the beauty of the Lord and inquiring in his temple. Then, as he strengthens authentic leaders, O oh, save your people and bless your inheritance, be their shepherd and carry them forever. And I've given this as a simple uh, illustration of my leadership team. God delivers his leaders that the leaders might help the Lord deliver his people. And this is how God shepherds his people. More so than ever in this hour in the earth, Legitimate apostolic voices have to be raised up to counter false teaching, false prophecy, false worship in the house. Psalm 29 is powerful. Psalm 29 starts out with, Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. We're back to powers and principalities. The Lord, first of all, calls to those divine beings in the heavenly council of the Lord, powers and principalities, 24 elders, living creatures, seraphim, cherubim, thrones, dominions. We'll use Old Testament terminology, New Testament terminology. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Now, glory is going to be the key word of this psalm. This is a psalm about God's glory. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. So first of all, we start with the heavenly beings and then to God's people. We are to ascribe glory to the Lord. And when we ascribe glory to the Lord, his voice will thunder. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The glory of God thunders. The Lord over many waters. There's some eschatological here, but let's, let's keep Revelation 10 in mind because Revelation 10 makes reference to Psalm 29, but watch the voice of the Lord. When God's glory is manifested in our midst, his voice thunders to us. And that thundering is very important because that thundering speaks of how God will accomplish his purposes in the earth how he will establish his kingdom in the earth. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The glory of God thunders. The Lord over many waters. Watch how many times voice is mentioned, the voice of the Lord. Next verse, the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. Those are the, the cedars of Lebanon, the mountains of Syrian. These are high cedars, high mountains. God has powerful authority. The highest mountain, Mount Hermon in Israel, is nothing when the voice of the Lord thunders. It skips like a fearful little calf of a noise when God speaks. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. 
The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness, shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. Seven times the voice of the Lord is mentioned. Seven times his voice thunders. The, there are seven thunders that are listed in Revelation 10. We're going to take a quick look at it as soon as we finish this psalm. And after the voice of the Lord thunders seven times, all in his temple cry glory. See, this is about the glory of the Lord, the manifest thundering presence of the Lord, God coming down from heaven to earth to establish his kingdom purposes in the earth. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The voice of the Lord stopped the flood from destroying the earth. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. He exercises his kingship when his glorious voice thunders in the earth. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Go with me to Revelation chapter 10. Seven times the voice of the Lord thundered in Psalm 29. We're in the middle here of the seven trumpets being blown in the book of Revelation. And those trumpets, when the seventh trumpet blows, chapter 11 of Revelation say, the kingdom of the world becomes the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, of his Christ. So we're in the midst of God establishing his kingdom rule and authority in the earth. Ten, in the middle of, these, uh, of, the, of the trumpets blowing. This is, this is in conjunction with uh, the sixth trumpet. Revelation 10.1, I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun and his legs like pillars of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea, his left foot on the land, and called out, called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. And lion roaring in the book of Amos has to do with the prophetic voice of the Lord, the Lord speaking to his servants, the prophets. He cried out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. When he called out, the seven thunders sounded. Psalm 29. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. This is the only thing that's sealed in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, by and large, is an unsealing of things that have been sealed in the Old Testament scriptures in the book of Daniel. This is the only thing that's sealed in the book of Revelation, the seven thunders. Seal up what the seven thunders have said. Do not write it down. Now, John has been writing up to this point. Chapter 1 through chapter 10, John has been writing things. What John is is kind of a, he's a, an observer in the first 10 chapters of the book of Revelation. All this revelation is just exploding in his life. Now there's a pattern here. We have to get it right with the Lord. We have to observe revelation according to heaven, according to the Lamb, according to the risen and ascended Jesus, according to the inheritance of God's kingdom, according to the shofar trumpet blowing of his kingdom. We got to get the revelation right. John is an observant and the angel says, don't write down. You've been writing for 10 chapters. John, stop writing. Seal it up. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it and the earth and what is in it and the sea and what is in it, that there should be time no longer. That's the end of chronological time and the beginning of prophetic time. It says chronos, no longer. Time no longer. I know most of your translations say delay no longer. Let's take it literally. There shall be chronos no longer. As God establishes his kingdom purposes in the earth, chronological time, that is 
time run according to human perspectives of history, according to human empires, human nations. This is all taking place. This revelation is during the time of Rome. Rome is the fourth beast in Daniel 7. It's the fourth great empire of the earth. Human time is relegated to nations of the earth, ruling and reigning in the earth. Time is stopping here in Revelation 10. We're going from Kronos to Kairos. We're going into prophetic time. Time according to God's kingdom purposes. See, this is important. This is why there are no more Christian nations, no more divine nations that are going to establish God's purposes in the earth. That's an old economy. That goes along with, with, with old covenant realities. That's pre-Christian realities. There, there's, to say that America is going to bring God's purposes in the earth is false. It's incorrect. We started prophetic time right here near 70 AD in the New Testament. Prophetic time is starting, and it means now the way that God's kingdom purposes are going to be defined in human history have nothing to do with any earthly nation. They have everything to do with the kingdom of God, with the people of God, with Christ. This is what it means to be really Christ-centered. There will be time no longer, but in the days of the trumpet call sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. The mysteries of God. We're unveiling. We're unsealing. Jesus has come. He is establishing his kingdom. It's through Christ. It's through the church. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's through the power of the gospel. It's not through any human mean, means that the Lord will define his purposes. And he will not only deal with setting human nations aside, he will remove false religion. He destroys the, 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 he destroys Jerusalem. He dismantles false worship so that real worship can now begin to take place. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me again saying, go take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who's standing on the sea and the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll and he said to me, take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. And it was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. Now that's a parallel to how Ezekiel was called. Ezekiel was told to eat a scroll and then to go forth and prophesy. This eating of the scroll has to do with the commissioning to declare apostolically and prophetically the purposes of the Lord in the earth. Look what he's saying to John. He's saying, you've been an observer, you've written, but now I want you to begin to proclaim and begin to do. And I, was, and I did as I was told. You must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. So there's this, this sealing up of the seven thunders says stop writing about these things. Stop just getting the revelation. Now go proclaim the revelation. See, there's a movement from being uh, one who receives revelation to now one who begins to move out in the authority of that revelation, prophetically and apostolically. That's, of course, from the book of Revelation. Let's go back to the Psalms and finish up. Go back to Psalm 29. Something, something very powerful in the background here. Something very powerful in the background. Extremely powerful. Seven thunders. The voice of the Lord thunders seven times. And as the voice of the Lord thunders seven times, the glory of the Lord is manifested. And it says in verse 9, And in his temple all cry, Glory! The Lord thunders glory. Now, now we move from the thundering of God's glory in 29, and we begin to look at 30 and 31. Now, in, in chapter 30, 
David now. It's a psalm, if you look at the inscription, at the dedication of the temple, the dedication of the house. The house is going to be dedicated. This could be Solomon's temple, and David is writing a psalm for his son who's going to build the temple shortly after David dies. This could be a reference that was taken up by Haggai and Zechariah when they came back from the exile and they rededicated the second temple that was built on the ruins of the first that was destroyed uh, by Nebuchadnezzar. This is also, this is that this psalm is actually recited by the Jews on Hanukkah. And Hanukkah, we know, is coming up in a week and a half. That's the rededication of the temple when Antiochus Epiphanes, a, a, um, a type of the Antichrist, came in and, and desolated the temple, tried to uh, uh, subjugate Israel to his pagan ways, and he offered a, a pig on the, on the, in the Holy of Holies to, to desecrate the name of Yahweh and establish uh, one of his his foreign gods. But that was the time of Maccabees, and of course, God gave his people the victory, and then on Hanukkah, they read the 30th Psalm. But it's, it's speaking about some God restoring the house to his people. We want the restoration of God's house in this. And it says in Psalm 30, verse 4 says, Sing praises to the Lord, O you his hesed ones, his saints, those who walk in his steadfast love and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Now, we have to understand this. Repentance is, is in the background here. Repentance is there in Psalm 27. Psalm 30, we're going to have repentance too as well in the background. Why does God sometimes remove his spirit from his people? Why does sometimes he just, like God disappears? Why does he do that? Maybe some people are thinking that's where we're at right now. Uh, God's disappearing. Why does God do it? He does it for a reason, to build into us a heart of repentance. Watch in verse six. Verse five again says, weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. That's the, the central idea behind this psalm. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. See, when everything's going right in the Lord, we feel his presence, his spirit is being poured out, our prayers are being answered, we're reading the word, it's flowing in, in, in revelation, we're ministering to people, they're coming to the Lord, they're coming to meetings, they're, they're coming in unity. And of course, those times of prosperity, we just say, I shall never be moved. Oh, God is so awesome. And then the prayer meetings we establish, we look around one day and the majority of the people who were in those prayer meetings, where are they? We have a worship service. Where's everybody at church? What, what, what happened? By your favor, O oh Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. See, there are times when God is moving powerfully in, my, in our lives. Then it said, you hid your face and I was dismayed. See, God removes his presence from us and the success that goes along with it to remind us that the source of God's power and grace is not in us, but in him and him alone. And we need to get this. This is how the house gets rededicated, how the house gets established. We go through those seasons. To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. Hebrew word, I make intercession for grace. That there's certain words for prayer in Hebrew, and this word is to pray, to intercede for God to pour out his grace when I plead for mercy. And then we remind the Lord that um, what profit is there in my death? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? And see, we're, we're bringing together his steadfast love and his faithfulness. Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. And then watch how it concludes. Remember the last one? When his voice thunders, everybody in his temple cries out glory. 
What's the definition of God's glory? It's his person. It's the revelation of his manifest presence. And in his manifest presence, it's also the manifestation of his power that gets things accomplished and gets things done. That's the glory of the Lord. He reveals his person and his power in his glory. And that's how we see who God is. We see who God is in his person and we see who God is in the mighty deeds he accomplishes on behalf of his people to establish his kingdom in the earth. That's glory. Now watch. You have turned my mourning into dancing. Verse 11. You have loosed my sackcloth and closed me with gladness. You've taken me from a psalm of lament to a psalm of victory, Lord. And you do this so that my glory may sing your praises and not be silent. See, when God manifests his glory, when he thunders his voice and the seven thunders raise us up to to go forth and do what God has called us to do, his glory becomes our glory. Our personhood and our power becomes rooted in who he is and the sound of his voice. Remember where we started all this in Psalm 33? By his word, he created the universe. See, God speaks the universe into existence. That's that's the whole story of the account of Genesis chapter one. God said, light be, and light was. God speaks the universe into existence. When his glory begins to thunder, when his voice thunders in our midst, his glory creates for us our righteousness. It creates our relationship. It creates our ability to perform the deeds of the Lord. Finally, I'm waiting for the the power to start going out. Psalm 31, the next psalm. Psalm 31, the the key verse is verse 5. It's something that Jesus, one of Jesus' seven final sayings on the cross. Into your hand I commit my spirit, O Lord. You have redeemed me. O Lord, God of faithfulness, God of truth, faithful God. That's um, that's Yahweh El Amet. It's it's the, the God of faithfulness, the God of truth, the God who is Lord over all, the God who is in covenant relationship with us. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Psalm 31 continues where Psalm 30 left off. But what we begin to see now in Psalm 31, four times chesed is mentioned. And I want you to see it. Psalm 31, verse five. I'll repeat it one more time. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. I hate those who pay regard to worthless idols. Contrasting the real glorious God with idols, Idols who have eyes to see, but they don't see. Ears to hear, but they don't hear. Mouths to speak, but they don't speak. But I trust in the Lord. I will rejoice and be glad in your chesed, your steadfast love, because you've seen my affliction. You have known the distress of my soul, and you have not delivered me into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a broad place. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief, my soul and body also. For my life is spent with sorrow, my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. And then he continues. We've seen the steadfast love of the Lord in verse 7. Now we go down to verse 14. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. Make your face shine on your servant to dwell in the temple of the Lord, to behold his beauty, to gaze upon his beauty. His face, his beautiful face shines on his servant. Save me in your stead fast love. O Lord, let me not be put to shame, for I call upon you. And remember, shame in in a biblical construct, shame means that I don't fulfill the purposes God has called me to fulfill. That's what real shame is. It's not this inner kind of pop psychology 
oh, I feel shame. It's not fulfilling the purposes of God. Verse 19 continues, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you and worked for those who take refuge of you in the sight of the children of mankind. In the cover of your presence, you hide them from the plots of men. You store them in your shelter from the strife of tongues. Again, in your sukkah, in your booths, feast of tabernacles here. Blessed be the Lord, for he has wondrously shown his steadfast love to me when I was in a besieged city. And then finally, it concludes, love the Lord all you his has said ones, his saints, those of you who are immersed in his steadfast love, those of you who trust in his steadfast love, those of you who embrace his steadfast love. The Lord preserves the faithful, but abundantly repays the one who acts in pride. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. Now notice Psalm 31 ends with be strong, let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. How did Psalm 27 end? Psalm 27, verse 14, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. That's Joshua 1 language. Take courage, Joshua. Every place that the soles of your feet trample, I give it unto you. Take, be strong. Take courage. Observe the ways of the Lord. I am with you, Joshua, to take this land. This is inheritance taking language in the Psalms. I've got two minutes, and I just want to give you Psalm 32. Psalm 32, the whole Psalm is about repentance. Psalm 32 is the Psalm that was written, uh, that was recited by the Jews. It was written for Yom Kippur. It was recited by the Jews on Yom Kippur. And it is, it is a reference to some great sin that David committed in his life. We always need to be repentant. And I'll just read us out with this psalm. Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose whose transgression is lifted up and moved out of the sight of the Lord. And transgression means severe rebellion. That's one of those willful sins in Scripture that people could have been sentenced to death for. David's not talking about just the kind of sins that that we experience because we stumble, we falter, we're weak, we're human, our, our perspectives are distorted. This is, save me from presumptuous sin, Lord, that I might be innocent of great transgression. Psalm 19, which we read last week. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. God covers sin, we're not to cover sin. We'll see that in a few verses. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. He doesn't impute iniquity to the man. And in whose spirit there's no deceit. There's the key. The key for forgiveness of sin is we confess. There's no deceit in our heart. There's no duplicity. We do not hide from the Lord. We don't run from the Lord. We don't live in denial. We stand before him naked. We stand naked before the Lord. There's an honesty. And scripture says if you confess your sins to him, he is what? Faithful. This is an aspect of his faithfulness. Faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us of all iniquity. 1 John. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. The Hebrew word is through my loud roaring all day long. Groaning isn't even close to the intensity of the word. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My inner vitality was dried up as by the heat of the summer. This, this, is, this is what happens for keeping sin in. And remember, David went a year between his sin with Bathsheba and her, his execution, his murder of Bathsheba's husband and confessing his sin to Nathan. He went a year. I acknowledge my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. Eventually, David got to the place where there was no more deceit left in his heart. No more denial. I'm going to confess my sin to the Lord. See, I don't cover my iniquity. God can cover our iniquity Blessed is the man whose sin is covered in verse one, but we can't cover it. I said, I will confess my transgressions, my serious rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. 
Therefore, let everyone who is godly, let everyone who is a chesed one, everyone who walks in his steadfast love, be repentant and confess your sins. Let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. The one who confesses his sin to the Lord, the waters of chaos will not overwhelm and destroy him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from my trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Now it's interesting. Is that the Lord speaking to David or is that David now who's learned the lesson of repentance, teaching others. It can go either way in the Hebrew. Be not like the horse or mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Don't force the Lord to force you. Let the graciousness of the Lord open your heart to be naked and honest before the Lord. If there has ever been a time in the history of the church where the church needs to be honest right now and get out of denial about things that are going on in the earth, in our lives, and in the church, it is now. This psalm is very important. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. And we started with chesed, we're gonna end with chesed. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Father, may again, this prophetic significance of the Psalms of David teach us how to walk in your ways, O God. How to see new beginnings, O Lord in the church, in the body of Christ, how to come out of the midst of all this, this, this conflagration, all out of the midst of all of this confusion that's going on in the earth and in the church. May we come out of it, Lord God, gazing on the beauty of the Lord, inquiring in his temple and being sustained by his steadfast love and his faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray it, amen. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Thanks for lasting with us. Amen.